Welcome to another episode of the Reboot Chronicles, a no-holds-barred forum with global leaders, authors, entrepreneurs, and CEOs about how organizations stay focused on growth and innovation in unprecedented times. I'm your host, Dean DeBias, coming to you live from Revive's North American headquarters in Chicago, and we would like to thank you for joining us from around the globe today. I'd like to welcome Ellie Rubenstein to the program today. She is the CEO of Mana Tree Partners. And today we're going to talk about the future of food, one of my favorite subjects, love to eat, um, and why private equity and venture is um, focused on this category so much. I think one of the reasons um, is it's just a huge space. Obviously, the Department of uh, Agriculture, if you believe their statistics, said the food service and the food retail industry supplied about $1.7 trillion, with a T, um, dollars worth of food in 2019. We'll talk about how these trends are getting all thrown off, of course, with the global lockdown. And globally, it's um, the market's about to reach, I'd say, about $12 billion, looking at a bunch of different estimates over the next few years, with a 5% kegger over the next five years. So it's amazing. Um, and that doesn't include the thousands of food and beverage startups that are out there, as well as the corporate venture capital activity. So we'll touch on that too. Ellie, welcome. We're so glad to have you here. You look like you're uh, outside having fun there. I am. I'm worried about the airplane above me. Sorry about that. We love airplane noises, especially if it's the Coast Guard helping out. The uh, You're in Anchorage, Alaska today? I'm in Anchorage, Alaska today. Yep, sun has been up. It doesn't go down. So uh, we're wide awake up here. I love it. That's awesome. So um, MANA is a pretty much a new group, um, and you have been, uh, you just closed your first round, the first fund, and you've already had, you've got several solid investments going on. And full disclosure to the audience, I am a, uh, on your advisory board, of course. But what a lot of the uh, viewers always want to know is, with people like you, is why did you start this? You could have really done anything, pretty much. Why, why this? Why now? Well, first of all, thank you for having us. Thank you for being an advisor. You've been with us since we were nothing. Um, when when you came to our house and in Colorado, yeah. and uh, you were willing to hear the story. So we appreciate you taking a chance on us. Um, to answer your question, yes, we did just close our fund. It's $141 million, first time fund. Nice. And it's really a unique time in history. Uh, myself and my two co-founding partners, uh, Ross and Brent, uh, saw the opportunity to build a next generation asset manager focused on the next 30 years. And what we saw was a shift in human health. Um, my own personal passion has always been sourcing my own protein, whether it's uh, via hunting or fishing. Uh -huh. But in our part, my partners, um, we also have all used what we would call food as medicine. So using functional medicine to actually increase our human performance, less on a, I'm sick, but more of prevention and longevity. And um, while many people might have been familiar with the earlier trends of plant-based growing, um, we saw that food was where the internet was about 15 years ago. And it's changing so fast, um, not just due to consumer patterns, but also from accessibility and basically how how do you match the world's growing need for food, where the production is with where it's needed? So a lot of larger macro trends, but um, I'd always zero in on to that uh, healthy food is now a trillion dollar industry. And especially in today's environment, um, post COVID, 90% of consumers that are making purchases um, are thinking about personal health. So, so now is the time um, for health. And there's so, whenever I look at the food space, especially the detailed reports, there's so many categories. How do you just, especially if you do food and beverage and, and health and wellness, there's just lots of little categories that are bigger than that trillion, uh, couple trillion dollar number I gave you, which is just basic foods. Um, how do you determine what categories are the right ones to go after? Hmm. So um, myself, it's been about 10 years in private equity. And one thing that we see is there's different types of private equity. So we're not a buyout, meaning that we can't, we don't control stakes companies. Right. But what, instead, the, the way we've tried to do that is looking at companies that are essentially vertically integrated so that we can have as much, uh, call it control or accessibility to the supply chain as possible. So if you're looking at food products specifically, there's four categories. You'd have the primary resource itself, the processing, the distribution, and the consumer brand. Um, right. We still like to have the consumer brand. That's what consumers um, usually go for. That's where the long-term loyalty comes from. Um, but what we know when we're seeing exacerbated by COVID, if you can't control the supply chain, 
very hard um, to make sure that you don't have supply chain shocks. So that's probably yeah. the first thing that we saw was a vertical integration and it's more of a franchisee model. And then the second thing is that we're very focused on, is it healthy for you? And uh, that's something that, you know, we might see a great ice cream company, but um, if it's not actually increasing your health, we're not usually looking at it. I uh, gotcha. Um, I'll ask Mondelez that question when they're on. <laughs> Is it healthy? Oh, uh, no, but gosh, Dean loves it. He just loves that stuff. Um, so the uh, so I, I get the categories. Uh, mm -hmm. You haven't, um, you don't sleep much like me. So tell us, you've already made a bunch of investments. Uh, just walk us through what's going on. What are some Actually, of your favorites? I sleep more than most. I think we're good about our time management. So oh, huh. we've made, <laughs> to date, we've made four investments in our portfolio, and we expect to have about 10, so probably about six more. Um, and if you look at our first four, what's clear is that they're all in the protein space. Um, for whatever reasons, humans seem to have this obsession about protein. So yes. um, we, we're, we're, we try to be as mainstream as possible with trends. Um, and so we're in two plant-based ingredient companies, and then also an egg and a beef company. Um, what's the common denominator about all of those is we have market share in those categories, whether it's um, the largest pasture raised organic beef company or um, in plant based ingredients, um, we have both mushroom and chickpea. We tend to, excuse me, invest in, in companies where um, it's usually still founder led and we like to be the second largest investor, sometimes working alongside of them. Um, I think it's worked out in our favor as you look at look at trends of where we're going. COVID seems to um, have just I think sped up these trends, but it didn't. So our portfolio was relatively unharmed from COVID, mainly because we were in smaller companies uh, that weren't affected by large manufacturing processes. So in plant base, it's no surprise that that market is growing. People are watching it. Um, it's now going to reach 14 billion in over the next five years, which is pretty astronomical. And some of the growth rates can be as high as 20 percent Kagers. Right. Um, and and I think what you're seeing now is it used to be that plant base. Uh, people thought was healthier for you. Now the new buzzword is it's 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 boosting your immunity. So yeah. it's always the buzzword, but that's the key one here. And then um, in our beef company, what, what's interesting about COVID is um, people are actually in grocery stores longer now. So they tend to be more mission driven. Um, the, the grocery shopping times have increased by 11%. So they're actually taking the time to not just read the label, but read the stories on the packaging. And that's exactly what consumers seem to want. They want to know where their food came from. Is it ethically sourced? What are the ingredients? You know, what's the environmental footprint? Um, so, and it's transparency. So that, that's definitely what we've tried to do is be able to tell a story that's accurate with our products. So the um, ingredient seems to be a good uh, category for you. What I've noticed is everyone wants healthy food. Everyone wants, wants, wants. And then I go sit down with some of the largest manufacturers in the world and they look at me and go, I can't get the ingredients. I'm like, what are you talking about at our scale? So you have made the smart move of doing that. Uh, isn't one of the companies right here in Denver where I am um, is the uh, one of the ingredient ones? It actually is. It's not sourced out of Denver, but the processing uh. is there. So that's Mycotechnology. Okay. And um, I would use that as example. I'd also use our chickpea company, Nutriati. Um, you know, one of the things that I was very blessed, I got a double master's at Purdue and in, in um, agriculture economics. And what they teach you is wow. that the food is a global supply chain. So in our chickpea company, the chickpeas are sourced from what's called the protein highway, which is both US and Canada. And that's what we always try to emphasize to people is know where your ingredients come from. Um, because most of these, there's usually uh, trends of ingredients, like my uh, morning breakfast is Rebel. Um, I did a, a different interview with the guy who does the pea protein sourcing out of for, for Rebel. Um, right. And same thing, that's also sourced out of Canada. So I, I think people are- Was that, a, was that a product placement you just did? <laughs> <laughs> it's not one of our companies. So I, I know it's not, that was a nice favor. But you know what? What's, this is a great example of what people want. They want functional products, right? Exactly. They want things yep. that are healthier for you. They're convenient. Um, it's not shelf stable, but um, the branding's pretty good, right? Energizing really elixir. Good. Yeah. So, yeah. but I think loves what that I would stuff. say about that is traditionally um, most of the countries for sourcing have been single source sourcing. So you'll usually see when you're looking at an investment. Um, for example, there's another product we look at where they're now using Peely nuts sourced out of you know, one country. And they usually try to what emphasize strong, strong supply chain that's called Lava. It's a great women-owned company. But, um, Peely and Peely nuts? Seeing, yeah, it's a new nut. De wow. Dean, you got to get with the new I've got to get. I've, I've missed the last <laughs> meeting. I'm sorry. What country is that but, from? 
Where do those Where are those grown? The point I want to make is a great example. You're going to see a shift down to South America. And so our beef company um, is sourced out of Uruguay. We're actually the largest organic exporter of USDA organic beef out of Uruguay. It's a it's a country that has more cows than people. Um, And the reason the emphasis is on South America now is that there's great farmland, um, great pastures. There's great it it tends to be um, better soil down there. And um, that's kind of where I think you're going to see a shift. A lot of this traditionally has come from China. So ag is traditionally a um, a very much trade dependent economy. And so I I would just tell people to pay attention from the sourcing of their ingredients so they don't have supply chain shock, you know, if there is a demand boost. Yeah, good point. The um, more cows than people. That's an interesting stat. Uh, I'll write that one down. So let's shift a little bit. We don't we're not too topical on this show, but there's too much going on in this sector. So just uh, you've mentioned supply chain. So brick and mortar and online merchants, um, they've been facing some really difficult challenges just trying to meet this intensified demand for food and beverages, grocery products. Um, you know, the big shift um, has just done massive changes to what's going on in supply chain as people have tried to move from commercial to retail. And it's it's kind of old news, but now on top of that, with the um, you know, the large guys reporting their quarterly earnings, you've got Walmart, Kroger, and Amazon record earnings. And um, artificially, in, in a way, I, you know, it's all going to adjust back, but there's some things that are not going back there. Do you see some opportunities that have been accelerated and uncovered in supply chain now because of what has happened? Yeah, I want to address first of um, the, the good that's happened. So yeah. there was a, a great research study that just came out. Um, we, we tend to track grocery stores. There's a great daily app. If anyone's looking at it called Placer, and you can put in yeah, your local good, grocery stores. It's a good you index. Foot traffic. It's great. Um, and so, but what um, nearly 70% of consumers are saying that they're not experiencing stockouts anymore. So I, I, I would mention that. And, and I know that both in the meat processors, they're basically back online. Um, our ag secretary said about 95%. So yeah, most of that's the yeah. good. That's the good news. Um, and then some of the other things is originally there was a lot of pandemic shopping of shelf stable food. While that has uh, teetered out a little bit, what you're not seeing teeter out is the frozen food aisle. Um, right. So those still can tend, tend to be up about 40 percent, and that makes sense. I think we've gone back to more of a World War II mentality of stock up, or I tell people it's a, the hunter mentality. Make sure you have your freezers full, right? So um, coming from just, Alaska, that means a lot. <laughs> it's being prepared, but you know yeah. what excites us is um, we're really in the world of e-commerce of food, and for the last ten years or so, e-commerce has been about more of affluent shopping, less on food, and so e-commerce rates are now at about twenty percent. But today, Dean, for food, they're only at three percent, and the reason being is that it, the supply chain of delivery is not that simple. Um, there's a reason why Jeff Bezos is the richest man of the world. He figured out how do you get food faster, better, and cheaper or products to, to the end consumer. So if it's at 3%, we, expe- we expect that to grow over the next few years. So we're very enthusiastic about the logistics and specifically about the cold chain logistics. You know, this product right here, if it's not at my grocery store, I would need to avail- order it online and it does it is perishable. So right. that's what we're focused on and is that last mile delivery as well as the packaging that's sustainable um, and carbon friendly. So um, those are those are the things that I think we're trying to look at and, and many people are as well. Yeah, the Revive um, Health and Wellness Beauty Index, uh, we've, been, we've been tracking all this year just the spikes in online demand and how um, online is now really accelerated to the point where it would have taken us five years to get even people like the uh, laggard uh, baby boomers who didn't, didn't really use a lot of digital are using it now. And and Walmart is really taking advantage of that with, with pickup and with all types of uh, uh, delivery services. So Amazon and Walmart have almost become a utility during this uh, pandemic. People are now starting to go back to stores. But the other trend is really interesting is over the last uh, five years, you know, the, the, the amount of dining in going down um, in your house and the amount of dining out going up totally flipped around again during this pandemic. Um, mm. Again, another supply chain issue. Um, the, uh, you know, some were, I think the stats for 2019 were 45% at home, 54% out. I actually think those are wrong. I think the out dining, it depends on what city you're talking about. Um, what what do you see uh, trends there? People, so eating healthy, there's, there's so many farm restaurants, right? But eating healthy usually means eating at home. Most of the time. Oh, sorry, I lost you for a second. That's all right. Yeah, so um, the 
the common strat that's that is so just so people understand what yep. what you're referring to. So basically you have stuff that you get in your grocery store or you have stuff that's not directly to you, which would be called the food service economy. So those right. would be restaurants, schools, hospitals, hotels. So with much of what hospitality shut down, um, it has shifted. So 54% of all food, and this is in the U.S., goes to food service. Right. Um, and so what's happened is it's not that easy to shift that into the grocery store because the packaging is not there. Um, and so while the FDA has allowed uh, for different types of packaging to get into the grocery store, um, it's still not that easy because usually it's in, in larger servings. Oh. So what, what you're seeing in Instead, is I think a lot of great local community generosity. I've seen on Facebook farmers saying, you know, I'd love to, you know, come buy a whole animal or come take my milk so it doesn't go to waste. Um, I think you're also seeing a shift in who the, the consumers are. So instead, they're going to food banks, not the who really need food. Um, and, and because schools aren't open or maybe hospitals or hotels don't need it as well. I think the one that's actually uh, getting hit the most, though, is seafood, because actually upwards of close to not, I believe it's 90 percent of seafood. Um, is usually straight to restaurants or food service, and it's exactly. fresh. Right. So in seafood, it's interesting because uh, now there's actually going to be probably more of a demand for frozen. And so that one, I think you're seeing it more. Um, and then obviously in beef, we, we do see it in our beef company. Sales have gone up, and that's because the grocery store now serves as, you know, how do you have that date night or family night? Um, you know, with meat. But seafood, I think, has been affected the most. And that's because in the supply chain, a fish actually touches hands nine times before it reaches your plate. It's more than any other protein. And probably the most sophisticated supply chain. It is amazing how you can get fresh seafood and veil. And if you trace it back to where it came from, you're like, wow, how did it get here so fast? So no, you can thank I, the Seattle Seafoods for that. The exactly. Right? So they kind of these invented it. And, uh, right. They've, they've done a really good job, Dean, of pivoting. Um, you know, distributors have tried to get up in line and say, you know, you can come do grocery shopping. You're also seeing a lot of restaurants do that. Um, some people don't want to go to the grocery stores. Um, I know my own mother hasn't really gone in the grocery store in, in many months. I think people that are more nervous about COVID have tried to find other smaller stores. So you're seeing restaurants shift a little bit, but it's a horrible situation that's going on. Um, you know, Restaurants are small businesses and they're the heart of our economy. And, and we're going to have to find a way um, to, to, to see something. So I, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I'll tell you in our investment firm, we're looking at seafood as a whole, um, mainly whether it is uh, farm seafood um, and there's a couple different types of farming, but also plant-based seafood. Um, we, we, we tend to see that's kind of where uh, beef is now. And, right. and I think why I keep reining in a seafood is that it's actually the world's most consumed protein. So it's 3 billion people depend on that every day for their main protein source. No, I think there's a huge opportunity there. And you must have ESP because the Q&A just popped up. Um, I'm only reading the ones that we haven't covered. And says, I just what saw do you... it, yeah. Yeah, it's like, uh, <laughs> so farm raised. Uh, I don't get plant-based seafood it's like plant-based it could be a burger it could be seafood stop it it's just what what is that yeah i don't want to i don't want to get in trouble here i'm so, asking um, for a friend i kind of know yeah the yeah yeah so essentially what it means is it, it, it doesn't come from the fish itself they're trying to replicate it with ingredients um, I, yeah. I don't believe we're at the cellular level of plant-based seafood yet but um it's been interesting to see the different types of ingredients used to replicate that you'll see anything from tomato to get the coloring of tuna. Um, we've seen it all. I think, again, our, we always go back to in our firm, is it healthier for you? I can't say today that it's as healthy as we'd want. I think it's still in the early levels of innovation, um, but it's definitely exciting to see this many opportunities uh, happen in seafood. Yeah, the whole plant-based thing is, is is fascinating. And the fact that you invested in a, in a meat company is almost counterintuitive, but I don't think so. I think it's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not going away. The um, Let's talk about mass production, which is usually where most of the negativity surrounds, you know, the way you can, you have to scale and process and preserve food versus, you know, organic versus local farm to table. Um, where's all that going to uh, end up in the, in the, you know, multi-billion dollar health, healthy food market? How does that scale? Yeah, I think in the current pandemic, the, it's definitely um, had a light shine on it. it. I think in the U.S., it's something like 10 processors can uh, process 80% of the meat in the U.S. But um, our investments not tend to be mass processors. And so I think the culture was a little bit different. We didn't have as many people inside. Um, 
the word processing itself shouldn't be a bad word because yep. it does need to get from a whole animal um, it, to something more resemblant of food. So I think where processing uh, it loses out is it sounds like you're adding things into it that are not from its uh, natural state. Um, I, I think point. you're going to farm to table um, is more local. While, while it does seem like people want more local, I would urge people to say not local in the sense of within 20 miles from your home. I think you're seeing more of a protectionist national type economies of we want it made in this country so that we can control things in case things don't happen. That's what I would expect more of um, yep. because companies still have to make money and it's hard to do that if they're not at scale. And I would also go back to the farmers, ranchers and fishermen. Um, it's easier for them if they're not handling the processing aspect in some ways if they're trying to scale. So that's why in our model, it tends to be more franchisee where you have a couple hundred of fishermen, farmers, ranchers, and then it's brought to a, um, a local point for processing distribution and then they handle the sale aspect. So that model seems to work pretty well um, if, from what we can see. And I would expect to see uh, more resemblance of that in other types of food, not just protein. Right. The um, what about things like you know growing in greenhouses? So here in Colorado, it's like most of that activity is around marijuana, uh, not so much. But when I go to Helsinki to visit Revive, they in the dead of winter, I'll get these amazing um, cucumbers and tomatoes on a salad that are grown in a greenhouse. I didn't know that. That's that's really local. You know, there is one in Colorado. Uh, you should go take a tour of it. They um, they actually now make salad dressing, uh, which is very innovative. So a value add oh, product in addition wow. to. Uh, but um, you know, that's probably if you think out of all the deals we've looked at, probably where we've seen the most deals. It's a very attractive sector. Um, it tends to be more an ag tech, so it's it's very capital intensive and has uh, attracted a lot of money out of it. We've seen deals now in several countries from this. We try to actually, um, we tried to figure out why and why so much money. And sometimes I link it more to an infrastructure play. It's really about food security. So right. sometimes some of the money pouring into it, um, it, it, it really looks more like a venture round, but that's, it's not always about financial return within a fun timeline, if that makes sense. Um, but now that some of them have been around for several years, they have reached scale. And so we're watching this play out, whether it's in the Middle East, where they do import 90% of their food. We've seen it in Canada. I, I, I'm not sure we've seen it as much in Europe, um, but definitely in the U.S. And so we're, we're eyeing that sector. Um, it's a great sector. What's great about it is there's no pesticides. Um, it, it, it obviously can solve a, a food security problem. Um, and then somebody once wise told me one of the reasons it's also attractive is there's no bugs in your food. So it's definitely a very controlled um, controlled atmosphere and it can meet food demand. Yeah, I love the one, the butter lettuce one I get where it's still growing in the pod. So you literally have a butter lettuce head with the root system on there in a plastic container and you put it in the fridge, it lasts twice as long. It's amazing. The it, question, the question so from the, uh, those. I know yeah, the question so from the those. audience was, was why is it lagging in the US? And my answer is we have so much land, like Holland is different. Um, I, I don't think there's been the motivation as much to invest in greenhousing types of things. Or, but really, it's almost like warehousing. It's not necessarily greenhouses. Why is it lagging in the U.S.? I'm not sure it's lagging in the U.S. So we did a side-by-side, -side and we looked at uh, the uh -huh. largest organic Good. lettuce company yep. um, in the U.S. and compared that. I think what it is is that when when sectors require a lot of money on the capital-intensive part, they're not profitable yet. And so until they're at scale and they're profitable, um, I think you're not seeing it at scale in grocery stores. Um, but I also think you're seeing a shift in farming and uh, f more farming is moving towards the north just from weather it, it patterns. Well, so I think it. they're happening at the same time. I'm just not sure they're getting the same amount of attention. Yeah, it makes sense. What about, um, so what we've noticed in health, wellness, beauty, food, beverage, telling your story, having an environmentally sound policy, there's lots of different variables now that go into packaging, but it's more actually the, the passion and the, the purpose of the company. Is that... Is that important in an uh, in investment um, analysis when you're yeah. looking at um, Packaging and labeling is something we think a lot about. So um, in one of our companies, I think they've done well uh, making an entire new category. I think we're seeing that in beef right now. Pasture raise is not traditionally a category people think of with beef. And um, it, it's mainly using regenerative ag practices. What we are seeing is I think there's two main themes emerging in food. There, there are, are, in the same way, food used to be more on the tech side um, or not on the tech side. Now what we're seeing is food on the more closely linked to the environment 
or most mm -hmm. closely right. linked to health. I actually think the environment side's moving a little bit faster um, under under this current administration. Um, there's a big push right now for carbon uh, nutrition labels, so showing the emissions output. And big food is actually leading the way on this. Um, you and as a consumer, what does that mean to me? You're you're using yes. less energy, or what's going on? It means that you're going to have a label, just like you have a nutrition label, you're going to have a label showing the carbon footprint. So all of the, um, and how they get to net zero emissions of, you know, what is the packaging on this? What, how, what did it take to get this to you? The whole process, everything. That. Yes. Oh, There's a really okay. big push on that right now. And, is there going um, to be some kind of a scaling rating system or because consumers have like a, a nanosecond. <laughs> consumers don't have, I don't, I've just noticed most consumers mass market, they don't have time to read all that, but there is a niche audience that does. They will they will tear apart a, a label. But yeah, just environmentally sound seems to keep resonating with, um, you know, with, uh, and, and when I look at mass manufacturing, it's it's a tough thing to pull off. The um, You talk about this historic shift in human health, I think is really critical, and food is medicine. Can you expand on some of that, uh, some of your thinking there? Yeah. Um you know, what's interesting is that, you know, if you look back over the last 50 years or so, um, while total life expectancy, you know, has increased since the 1950s, um, the, 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 the quality of life We're losing you there a little. We're losing you there a little bit because of the uh, so you Alaska Airways. You want to hear? Sorry, can you hear me now? Did I lose you? You're coming back a little bit, but you're. Uh, okay. It's understandable I, where you are. When I when a plane flies over, I think it messes with it. <laughs> um, but okay. I think when you look at that globally as well, yeah. um, it, you know, seventy percent of deaths are now uh, related to basically a lifestyle related disease, and Whoa. so seven um, zero. Yes, yeah, wow. and it's pretty bad. Um, and so I think you're seeing the food as medicine concept play out yeah. um, within NIH in the U.S. Um, food as medicine is actually now gaining a mainstream push and will become its own category. And so what people are really looking at is diet and lifestyle choices and how that affects your health. And so, you know, like I said, three out of the seven top trends of death can be linked to uh, diet and lifestyle, whether that's heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, diabetes. So I, I do think equally, while we talked about the carbon labeling here, you're going to see the health labeling change. Um, and that's, and then there's also, I think things that excite us is, you know, healthcare traditionally is one of the largest expenditures, um, it, it government spending with Medicare and Medicaid. And there's some very exciting exciting programs of how can you reach a different socioeconomic statuses who are usually the ones that are affected by this most because they're not getting um, more uh, nutri nutri nutrient as much nutrient dense food. Exactly. And so we're seeing programs now um, where you can actually do prescriptions to actually help that with healthy food. So that's, I think, what we're trying to look at is this is not an elite category of how do I go to a grocery store and get a fancier brand? This is how can we affect human health by making sure not only the supply chain, which goes all the way down to the phytonutrients, um, and that's something that most people aren't familiar with. So that's basically saying, okay, nature created this product. How do we use that and then use technology to get that faster to people? Not and how do we change it? Yep. And then and, that thereby helping make people healthier is what and, we're focused on. And, and back to processing, how it doesn't take everything out of it. Like I've heard some plant-based products, soy, the, after it's processed, it uses, loses a lot of its uh, nutritional value, things like that. We um, we had uh, Naveen Jain on from Viome the other uh, little while back. And so they basically test you and then tell you exactly what foods you should be eating based on your type and your DNA. And he's convinced that I'm eating all the wrong foods and I haven't had time to take the test. So I'm probably a good example. Um, do you see you know, that? One, one note on that. Um, yeah. My last name is, is Jewish and I have always thought I had severe allergies and I went yeah. through similar testing like you just described. Yeah. Um, and it turns out what I actually have, and, and I do think I've played probably, my doctor said, good defense on making sure the allergies are now at bay. I've yeah. had my first ever allergy test in 30 years that didn't have extreme sensitivities where I you know, needed the EpiPen. Um, but what was interesting is I had extremely high levels of mold toxins. And that's something that I really tried to have been figuring out. And what you look at is most grains and 
nuts um, have high arson levels or mold toxins in their soil. And um, I think big food is actually working on that, um, which, yep. which really excites us because you really do it's need good. to partner with big food or big pharma. Um, and so Danone has actually just now announced a very big initiative in the first to our knowledge where they're using AI to discover new health benefits. In plants. So exactly. it's something right. to keep an eye on. You know, if 40 percent of all nuts and grains have these car carcinogens in soil, that could actually be some of the um, issues that we're seeing in human health. So I saw a pop question pop up. I think Big Pharma is also looking for, for solutions here. You know, if you go back to the Bayer Monsanto merger, that's a great example of ag and health coming together. Um, oh, it yeah, really sure. is a convergence of industries. They also don't want to lose out. It's both offensive and defensive <laughs> there, I think. No. Hallie, we really want to really thank you for uh, coming on. Um, I just think it would be nice to get your, um, there's a lot of aspiring founders out there who are working on F&B, food and beverage startups or health and wellness, take, take any category. They're all coming together. Um, you know, some are doing well, some are struggling, some are just early. They're just getting started. What kind of advice would you give some of the founders and entrepreneurs listening in on, and, you know, just things that they should be thinking about over the next few years as they build their companies? It's such a great question and so needed in this time. And um, follow your passion. Um, in my case, this came out of um, wanting to use food as actual medicine. Um, I didn't respond well to medicine. And um, I will tell you, I think most people would agree the startup journey can be very lonely because if you have an idea and you're obsessed about it, you have to be able to convince everybody else it should happen. Um, and I think that in this time where we all need healing around the world, food is such a comfort item. So whatever it is, if you can bring people together um, with your passion, that provides healing and um, we need startups are the lifeblood of our economy, the small businesses. So find a way um, to bring happiness to people, bring peace to people. And I think there's no better way than to pour your heart and soul into a startup and into a company. And um, it's a great experience. And especially fundraising, you do have to be able to convince investors to do it. Um, for any of you interested, I just wrote an interesting post on 100 Things Learned Raising a Fund, a first-time fund. Um, it's not an easy journey, no different than raising startup capital. But I think now is, is um, the, be the one of the best times ever. I think there you're going to see an innovation economy come out of this, lots of change. Um, I'm personally trying to support local startups more, especially um, homegrown, you know, things you would see at, at farm stands, right? Right, um, exactly. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's just a great time. And um, don't doubt yourself. Um, really don't listen to other people. It's about you. And if you have an unquenching thirst, kind of like what you look at what Elon Musk just, just achieved, that's incredible. That's a great moment in, in our country's history. Um, and he never wavered from it. And that took him at least 10 years to do. So, um, you know, I always remind people these things don't happen overnight. It, it, it's, it is a marathon. Stick with it. And um, the reward comes from solving the problem itself. Yeah, so exactly. stick with it. It's really a good time. Yeah, we're going to have Elon on uh, sometime this uh, this fall. Oh, wow. Um, great advice, by the way. The um, I, I think the whole concept of, you know, they're obviously following this passion because they are in food and beverage. It's not the easiest category in the world. You know, no. you have to deal with a lot of things like money, co-packers, and distribution. And they get stuck in that. Yeah. So the, the passion and side one, is critical. One thing I would add on that, um, you know, it's, it's a tough time right now to get new products in grocery stores, yes. but I would say don't only look to grocery stores. There's other ways to sell products. Exactly. So I think the people that can figure out the new ways are the ones who are going to take off. And that's the exciting challenge is new ways to get customers. Yeah, I love it. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to Ellie Rubenstein, the CEO of Manatree Partners, which is headquartered in Vail, Colorado. Um, I think the next time we talk, maybe I should come up to Alaska. We'll Please. we'll do a live session. We just we just need to get a bigger a bigger broadband pipe when we all set oh, up there. We can fill your freezer, fresh fresh salmon. Ah, uh, that's my favorite. Love it. Thanks for joining us. See you soon. Thank you, Dean. It's a pleasure as always. Thank you. You're welcome. Cheers. <laughs>